Second important point, some level of separation of duties is a must. If one person has the entire operation under his or her control, that temptation exists and some will fall. Back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth and I was studying accounting, I was taught that failure to implement some basic level of internal controls makes the organization's management equally liable with the person who committed the misappropriation. Now that may not be election law, but it certainly is an interesting way to think about it. Uh, we've seen that happen a number of, a number of times too. Uh, we had a case a while back, uh, corporate PAC, major defense contractor, treasurer and assistant treasurer. Assistant treasurer ran the whole show day to day. The uh, corporation's internal audit staff came through, did an audit and said, you know, guys, you really ought to sort of separate out some of these duties because you're exposed here. And the treasurer said, thank you very much, handed the report to the assistant treasurer to take care of implementing the recommendations. Well, nobody ever checked on the assistant treasurer and you guessed it, the assistant treasurer was stealing from the pack. Got about $175,000 before uh, it was discovered, and it was discovered because we sent an audit contact letter out, and people started looking at things, and the next thing you know, the assistant treasurer had resigned and left town. Never a good sign. Uh, had a, had a, uh, another situation, it was a joint fundraiser between a senator and a state party, and they had hired a well-known outside consultant to handle the joint fundraiser. And when I say handle, I mean everything. And when the problem there finally came to light again, about $175,000 was missing and there was no getting it back. Third point to remember, no system of internal controls is foolproof and we can't cover every possibility. Rather, what you achieve is quote, reasonable assurance, unquote, that assets are protected and effectively used. Uh, the good news is that most of the schemes that the commission sees are not complicated or sophisticated schemes. They are schemes that some basic precautions would have detected or prevented uh, had they been in place. And in the category of you can't think of everything, we also have a case that we're, uh, I guess, just sort of finishing up, where though many of the internal controls that we recommend, the basic internal controls were in place, the committee had two employees who also had a business. The employees were both approving payments and preparing the invoices for the business. So they would prepare an invoice, send it to themselves at the committee, they would approve it, and it would get paid. And shockingly, it seems that they were padding the invoices a little. This is not one that you're going to find in either one of those policy documents, but it demonstrates that you can never cover everything. And so you not only need to look at policy statements, but you need to think as you go about how to cover yourself so that uh, the worst doesn't happen. Finally, the commission policy statements and the guidance that we've uh, put out there doesn't require any committee to do anything they don't want to do, even if they should. Internal controls are like insurance. Each person gets to decide whether the premium is worth the protection. The commission is providing a way for committees to protect themselves and some free advice. What each committee does with it is up to them. Now, having said that, and hoping you were listening to half of it and will remember 42% of it, let's talk about some of the things that the commissions that are in the commission's documents. First, the safe harbor policy. It says you should open all the bank accounts in the committee's name, not in the name of any individual like the treasurer and so forth. Now, this seems like some very common sense 
advice, and it is very common sense advice, but we've seen it done the other way. If that person's social security number is on the check, as far as access to the funds go, it's their account. And it is not a good arrangement when you're dealing with the assets of what is essentially a business entity. Further, it could cause problems with the IRS for the person whose social security number is on the check. So as easy as it is to get an employee identification number, it can be done online in a matter of minutes. Don't even think about using anybody's social security number. Review and reconciliation by someone other than the folks who do the day-to-day -day transaction process. This is huge. Put it in the 17% bucket that you'll remember a week from now. Many committees that I see don't ever do a reconciliation. And if there was one thing that I could have committees do, this would be it. I signed off on an audit report uh, a few days ago where the receipts were off by 1.2 million and disbursements by 600,000. It was a $2.5 million committee. No evidence of malfeasance, just really bad accounting practices. I'm not suggesting that these sorts of differences are the norm, but they happen. Nearly 60% of our audit reports have a finding concerning the misstatement of total receipts and, and disbursements. A reconciliation is the first thing my staff does as a part of an audit. And if we go in and find that it's way off, it is a very strong indicator that there will be other problems as well. I'll share a conversation with you that I had after the commission meeting when these policy documents were approved. And I was talking with a practitioner that I've known for nearly three decades, and I made the comment to him that if all committees did this one thing, it would make a huge difference in the quality of the report. He countered that if all committees did this one thing, he'd be out of business. And I don't think he is particularly worried about not having anything to do. Reconciliations by someone other than those who process transactions does two things. First of all, there is a necessary separation of duties and that allows a, a fairly convenient check for unauthorized transactions or more commonly just errors. And ideally this needs to be a three-way three, to three -way reconciliation. Bank records to accounting records and then to disclosure reports. That of course assumes that the accounting records and the uh, is, are separate from the filing software. If you're using a package like QuickBooks or Peachtree, they include uh, reconciliation processes that are really quite easy to use. And then the reconciliation from there to the disclosure report should be a lot easier because presumably you've already identified most of the errors and adjusting entries. Uh, in a recent report that I, audit report that I read, the committee filed some rough reports and knew it, but it wanted to file something. And later it, it filed amended reports and in one year added two and a quarter million dollars to what it had reported. Close, right? Then my guys go in later and we do an audit and we look at the bank versus the amended reports, off by six figures. And my favorite, cash was off almost $300,000. Reported balance, negative 200,000 and change, real balance, about 86,000. You can't file a report like that accidentally if you take the time to do some monthly reconciliations. Another recent case, the committee have filed amended reports showing a substantial increase in activity over the original reports. They were referred to our ADR office, Alternative Dispute Resolution, and they paid a fine. We went in later, do an audit, and we did the reconciliation to the bank, which the committee had obviously not done with either the original or the amended reports. And the original reports were correct in the first place. Needless problems for themselves. 